The interior of the antique shop was exactly as Alexander had surmised, marked by chaos, decay, and the gloom of a failing business. A mere glance at the dust accumulated near the display window was enough for any visitor to imagine just how miserable the life of the owner must have been, the first thing he noticed was the display tables near the walls on both sides. Large vases, sculptures, and unidentifiable totems rested on the solid, low tables, while the wall behind the tables was lined with shelves for smaller merchandise. The counter was positioned directly opposite the entrance, resembling a long bar. The shelves behind the counter, also dust-covered, were filled with somberly colored picture frames and small ornaments, behind the counter, a staircase leading to the second floor could be seen, its structure obscured by dim lighting. There was a small door under the staircase which, according to his memory, led to a storage room at the back of the shop, half of which was filled with clutter. It was hard to imagine that the cultist, whose body he now inhabited, managed to scrape by, running such an unappealing shop and still had money to spare for offerings to the sun god's priests, Alexander moved towards the counter at the back, the aged wooden floor creaking under his weight. As he passed the staircase, he noticed a lamp fixed to the wall. It was an electric lamp. Alexander's brows furrowed slightly, the style of the lamp was foreign to him, with its wrought iron frame and dusty shade exuding an exotic allure. However, the structure of the tungsten filament bulb inside was unmistakable, the lamp was powered by electricity, had electricity become so widespread in this world? Did ordinary citizens in the lower city use electric lamps too? Then why were gas lamps, oil lamps, and torches used as light sources in the sewer? Why were the street lamps gas-powered, a profound confusion arose in Alexander. This seemed illogical, especially in the environment of the sewer, compared to clean and safe electric lights, gas lamps with their open flames and flammable gas had obvious disadvantages, he had originally thought that technological limitations forced the city's managers to use gas lamps as light sources in the sewer. However, it now appeared, at least in the city-state of Prand, technology had advanced to the point where electricity was commonplace in ordinary households, a strong sense of incongruity filled Alexander's mind. He tried to search for corresponding knowledge in the fragments of memory in his mind but only found answers such as, this is common knowledge, and this is how city planning is. It seemed that either this knowledge was not made public to the people, so the cultist he now inhabited knew nothing about it, or this knowledge was so basic that it did not leave a strong enough impression in the cultist's mind. As a result, the corresponding memory quickly blurred and faded after his death, leaving only the impression of common sense, with a sense of unresolved confusion, Alexander reached out and turned on the electric lamp. With a soft click of the switch, a bright light immediately illuminated the area around the staircase and the counter, there was another switch on the opposite wall that controlled the lighting in the rest of the shop on the first floor, but Alexander had no intention of using it for now. At this late hour, a single lit lamp in a closed antique shop could be explained away as the shop owner moving around at night. However, suddenly turning on all the lights might attract unwanted attention, using the limited light near the staircase, Alexander's gaze first swept over the nearest merchandise. The first thing that caught his eye was a wooden totem, less than half a meter tall. The wooden totem was decorated with strange face patterns in red and blue paint. Next to it was what appeared to be an antique ceramic vase. They both had price tags with outrageous prices, the original price was 420,000, discounted to 306.IT reeked of self-deprecation, Alexander quickly shifted his gaze and scanned the rest of the shop. If there was a single genuine item here, he would have the wanderer crash into the walls of Prand, the items were as fake as they could be. One didn't need a genuine collector to authenticate them. Any sane person would not believe that a real antique would be sold in a shop located in the lower city. Would someone dealing in antiques really choose to operate in a slum? The oldest thing in the shop was probably the sign at the entrance, but Alexander was not surprised by the existence of the shop itself. The shop owner knew he was selling fakes, and those who came to buy also didn't expect to bring home a statue with a thousand-year history. Everyone knew what was going on. The lower city citizens also needed a way to satisfy their spiritual needs. The antique's sign at the entrance was not for others to see, but for the buyers themselves, after all, even under the overpasses on earth, there were people selling jade. A bracelet for 98, claiming to be old pit ice kind, which shattered into glass shards at the slightest knock. Did the buyers and sellers not know what was going on, Alexander was not interested in the miserable life of the shop owner. He was only concerned about one thing. This place could serve as his first footing on land as the captain of the wanderer. A forward base for understanding the world on land and modern civilized society. He had quietly made a decision. As long as the conditions of spiritual wandering allowed, he would try to maintain his current body as much as possible and use this antique shop as a cover to operate in the city state of Prand. If the training of AI went smoothly and AI could stably and controllably transport real objects between the wanderer and Prand, this antique shop would also become a secret transit warehouse for supplies. Alexander moved to the back of the counter and sat down on a chair, carefully sorting out the fragments of memory in his mind, deducing all possible hidden dangers. The original owner of this body was a follower of the sun god, but was only a low-level member within the entire church. Structure 
Due to the continuous crackdown on cult activities by the city authorities, the living space of the followers of the sun god in the city-state had been squeezed to the limit. Their contacts were extremely cautious. In addition to wearing full-cover hoods and masks for any gatherings, many low-level members only had one or two specific contact persons to connect with the upper echelons of the church. This was undoubtedly a good thing for Alexander now, this meant that even within the cult, only one person knew his real identity and contact method. Once this person was gone, no one else would know about his secret heretical identity that he could walk proudly in front of the city's administrators, his identity being that of an upright citizen and the even better news was that after carefully sorting out his memories, Alexander confirmed that this biggest hidden danger had actually disappeared because his contact person was one of the three black-robed cultists he had seen when he first woke up, those three unfortunate ones had been pigeonholed by the doves that he relaxed a bit and settled into a more comfortable position in the chair, with the biggest hidden danger gone, if there was anything else to worry about, it would be the other followers of the sun god who were present at the sacrificial ceremony in the underground meeting place, and the even larger and more mysteriously dangerous church of the sun god behind these followers that if the memories in his mind were correct, the city-state of Prand had launched a severe crackdown on the sun god church entrenched in the city four years ago. Since then, this heretical faith had been on the decline in the city. They were lucky if they could hide their identity and not be caught by the church's guardians, let alone hold any ceremonies, but now, these extremely low-profile cultists had done something very high-profile. The purpose of the sacrificial ceremony was to please the gods and to gather power or enhance the influence of the gods on the real world. The cultists present at the meeting place, including the messenger, who presided over the ceremony, were actually only the lowest-level members of the Church of the Sun God. Would these low-level members spontaneously organize such a major event? Alexander didn't have too many memory fragments in his mind, and a low-level cultist certainly wouldn't have access to the core secrets of the church. But just from the available information, he could guess that the cultists who suddenly started the event must have been directed by a higher level, the heretical sect that worshipped the true sun god, they wanted to do something big in Prand, and the sacrificial ceremony that was accidentally disrupted by him was probably just the most insignificant splash before the start of this big event. Alexander didn't have any particular feelings for this city-state of Prand, but if he wanted to start his operations from here, he had to consider what impact a group of madmen like the followers of the sun god would have on him if they ran amok in the city. The city, under a curfew, was not suited for exploration. Instead, Alexander spent the entire night in the antique shop. The excitement of setting foot on land kept him energized as he explored every nook and cranny of the building, the original owner of this body was undoubtedly a cultist, but he was also a normal person who needed to live in a normal society. He needed the conveniences provided by modern civilization to survive, he needed to interact with people, and he needed various daily necessities that he needed to engage with the city. All of this left a multitude of clues that allowed Alexander to roughly deduce his way of life in the city state of Prand and the general technological level and state of the people in this era. Even when his memory fragments were unclear that he found some cash in a secret compartment behind the counter on the first floor. Including a handful of small coins and several blue and green bills of various denominations. This was the legal currency used in most city-states, jointly certified and issued by the city-state governors and the Infinite Sea Trade Association. The main currency unit was called the Tsora, and there was also a peso worth a tenth of the main currency. The cash Alexander found added up to just over 200 soras, which according to his fragmented memory, was enough for a family of three to live in the lower city area for about a month. It seemed that even though the shop's business was sluggish and most of his assets were donated to the church, the original owner of this body still maintained a basic standard of living. This suggested that this antique shop had a steady customer base. The shop was divided into two parts on the first floor, with the sales area occupying two-thirds of the space in front of the stairs, and the remaining third being a warehouse behind a small door by the stairs. There was also a door at the back of the warehouse, which served as the back door of the entire building, and presumably also the entrance and exit for receiving goods, the structure of the second floor was a bit more complex, with a bathroom, two rooms of different sizes, and a shared duct room with the adjacent building. The rooms were located on either side of the stairs on the second floor and were kept relatively clean, there was also a small kitchen on the second floor, but it seemed that it hadn't been used in at least half a month, everything was covered in a layer of dust after inspecting everything, Alexander returned to the master bedroom on the second floor. He looked at the room, which was even smaller than his single apartment, and his gaze fell on the small cabinet next to the bed, there was a picture frame on it, inside, was a black and white photograph that I and the photo was a family of three, a modestly dressed young couple with a little girl who looked about four or five years old. They stood in front of a clearly artificial courtyard backdrop, their faces bearing faint smiles as they looked towards the camera. Alexander approached the frame and picked it up, examining it closely and constantly comparing it with the vague and jumbled clues in his memory. The original owner of this body was not in the photo, the people in the photo seemed to be close relatives of the original owner of this body. Very close people. As he stared at the young couple, Alexander felt a faint 
sense of longing emerging from the depths of his memory, however, more information about the photo was unclear, as if, more memories of them had disappeared from this world along with the last breath of the original owner of this body that he put down the photo, pondering what level of consumption a black and white photo would represent among the common people in the lower city area, pondering the state of photographic technology in this world, and the principles behind the equipment used at the same time, his gaze fell on the neatly made bed, and a faint doubt rose in his heart, would a cultist who had completely fallen into the worship of the sun have much time to keep his room so clean in his daily life, the shop floor on the first floor was clearly neglected, so how was the bed in this bedroom kept so meticulous, he went outside again, into the smaller room across the stairs, looking at the neatly made bed and desk that he sorted through his memories, confirming that the original owner of this body, a cultist named Ron, had left the shop several days ago to attend a gathering of sun worshippers, that was his last departure, the details of the memory were blurry, but there didn't seem to be any impression of cleaning up the house before he left. So, were there others? Were there others living with this, cultist? Relatives? Alexander furrowed his brow slightly, searching for corresponding clues in his mind while standing in front of the desk in the small room. His gaze scanned over the neatly arranged pens and stationery, finally resting on a book, the book was placed in the most prominent position on the desk. Its deep blue cover bore a pattern of gears and linkages, and the beautiful script on the cover read Art of Steam and Gears, General Textbook 3 Alexander furrowed his brow, he had a vague sense that this room belonged to another person, but he still instinctively picked up the book. On the Wanderer, there were no books to read, and he hadn't found anything in the rest of the shop or the master bedroom that might help him understand this world. As he opened the cover, the illustrated pages came into view. It was indeed a textbook on engineering techniques and the principles of steam machinery, and there were many annotations left by the owner of the book between the sections of the textbook, the delicate and beautiful handwriting seemed to be from a young woman, Alexander rubbed his forehead. The original owner of this body didn't seem to have any relatives or friends. Most of the images or impressions in his memory were cold and lonely. But after sorting through his memories several times, he finally vaguely remembered someone, a girl with dark brown hair. It seemed to be the only figure that the cultist named Ron had in his mind when he breathed his last. Alexander's eyes fell on the pages of the book. He didn't bother to read the technical sentences and blueprints, but chose to read sections like the editor's preface and concept exploration. A line of text suddenly caught his eye flame, or more precisely, the specific flame released by burning the fat and mineral crystals from the deep sea is the cornerstone that supports the operation of modern society and protects our civilization. Modern civilization's prosperity and order are built on the foundation of flame and steam. Clean and convenient electricity cannot replace the demon-repelling effect of fire, nor can it keep large machines running stably for a long time. Experiments have shown that steam is the most stable form of power under the influence of deep space. In this chapter, we will discuss the three typical architectures of the steam core and explain the mechanical principles and design ideas within, Alexander's eyes slightly glazed over. He remembered the gas lamps, torches, and oil lamps that were everywhere in the sewer, the street lights in the city streets, and the doubts in his heart when he saw the electric light in the shop. So, the reason for these seemingly strange situations was that fire could to some extent resist the spread of certain dangerous and bizarre things, Alexander felt an indescribable emotion well up in his heart. His gaze continued to move down. Seeing the complex blueprints, the dense annotations, and the diligent notes left by the book's owner. It was a machine he didn't understand at all, and it was definitely not the steam engine he knew from his past life, those precision gears, those extremely complex cylinders, and the pipes and valves between the parts, all far exceeded the concept of a steam engine. Instead, they looked more like some kind of device that had jumped out of a fantasy illustration, displaying a contradictory and bizarre beauty everywhere. This was the heart that supported the advancement of civilization in this world today. That I in contemplation, Alexander slowly put the book back in its original place, because he couldn't understand it at all. As a person from Earth, even as a former teacher, he couldn't make heads or tails of the steam powered mechanisms developed to the extreme. In this book, but even so, a vague sense of enlightenment emerged in his heart. The development of civilization in this world seemed to be on a path completely different from what he knew. I, in order to survive in a world full of crises, the realm of mortals also presented a bizarre appearance. But no matter how strange the world, as long as it can be called civilization, it must have its own logic and reason for its development. Those gas lamps burning in the sewer, the electric lights in the shop, and the steam machines depicted in the book, all condensed from the wisdom of countless people, all subtly revealed a Alexander placed the book back and checked the rest of the room's furnishings, finding nothing of value. The small bedroom was pitifully sparse and seemed to be rarely used. The most valuable clues were the book and two old notebooks stashed in the desk drawer, the notebooks were filled with content related to steam engines and engineering principles, interspersed with occasional complaints about certain teachers or classmates. This made it easy to deduce that the room's occupant was a young person of school-going age, Alexander slowly sifted through his fragmented memories, returning everything in the room to its original state before retreating to the master bedroom. After pondering for a while on the edge of the bed, he rose and approached the nearby cabinet. 
Almost instinctively, he opened the cabinet door and pulled out a drawer, several bottles of strong alcohol were hidden deep in the drawer, along with half a box of painkillers meant for pain relief and nerve relaxation. These were the belongings left by a cultist named Ron, that he was gravely ill and beyond medical help. The low-grade alcohol and temporary painkillers were always kept in the drawer, but they were of no help in prolonging the life of a sick man. So, the man who had lost hope in life turned to the solar cult. The preachers told him that the healing power of the sun god could cure all stubborn diseases, purify the body and mind of those who converted. To some extent, the cultists did keep their promise they had bloody and bizarre rituals, using blood as a medium to channel the life energy of innocent people into the bodies of sick believers. Alexander did not know the principle of this ritual, nor did he know if it could really cure incurable diseases. But according to the residual content in the memory fragments, the cultist named Ron did improve after the ritual, and further became a devout follower of the sun, even donating most of his wealth to the messenger, however, Alexander did not care about what happened between the dead cultists. He reached deeper into the drawer, successfully finding a hidden compartment. After fiddling around inside for a bit, he found a revolver and a box of well-preserved bullets, the city-state of Prand did not prohibit citizens from carrying guns, but it required legal procedures. An antique dealer living in the lower city area obviously lacked the funds and identity to apply for a gun license, so this was undoubtedly an illegally possessed weapon. For caution, the original owner of this body left the gun at home and did not take it to the gathering place. He probably used it to protect his shop, but now the gun belonged to the captain, Alexander knew that this was just an ordinary weapon. Compared to the abnormal objects on the Wanderer, even his seemingly outdated flintlock on the ship might have special power surpassing this revolver. But he was a realist. He knew that he was not as safe in the city-state of Prand as he was on the ship, and the body he was using now was made of flesh and blood, and many parts of the city were not safe, after all, he couldn't always let the pigeon, pigeon, people whenever something happened, eyes movements were too big and would easily attract unnecessary attention from the church forces in the city, just then, a faint noise suddenly caught Alexander's attention that he heard the sound of keys rubbing from the direction of the shop's front door on the first floor, followed by the sound of the door opening and hurried footsteps, Alexander quickly tucked the revolver close to his body, and it was only then that he noticed that it was already bright outside, he had been busy in this antique shop all night. The pigeon eye suddenly started chirping on his shoulder, you have a new short message. Quiet, Alexander immediately glanced at the pigeon, quickly saying as he walked towards the door, stay in the room for now, wait for my command. Also, don't speak if there are outsiders present. I immediately flapped its wings and flew towards a nearby cabinet, I captain. Alexander quickly left the room, and as he was just about to reach the stairs, he heard the hurried footsteps already on the stairs, followed by a young and hurried girl's voice coming from below, Uncle Alexander? Is that you who came back? The next second, a young girl wearing a brown dress and white shirt with long brown hair came into Alexander's line of sight, the girl looked only 17 or 18 years old, petite and thin, her hair seemed to be still wet with morning dew, her face was not very outstanding, but she had the youthful beauty of her age, she widened her eyes at Alexander standing at the top of the stairs, her face surprised and unexpected. Alexander didn't respond, he just stood silently on the second floor. The sunlight coming in from a narrow window behind the stairs against his figure, hiding his expression in the haze, he silently looked at the girl for several seconds before finally slowly saying, what did you just call me? Alexander? Uncle? There was a moment of surprise on the girl's face, followed by a slight nervousness, she held onto the stair railing next to her, cautiously peering up, as if trying to see the expression on the face of the middle-aged man upstairs in the backlight, is there something wrong? You? Have you been drinking again? You haven't been home for several days. I just saw the light on the first floor, the girl's expressions and voice fell into Alexander's eyes and ears, she obviously didn't know how to hide her emotional reactions according to the memories he had consumed, this girl should be his body's original owner's, niece, and his only relative, Alexander vaguely determined that the girl didn't think there was anything wrong with what she said, and didn't realize that the, Uncle Alexander, she referred to was a misnomer from the start, where did, the problem lie? Why would this girl, who theoretically couldn't possibly know his secret, so naturally utter the word, Alexander, various speculations whirled quickly in his mind, and at the same time, Alexander also found a bit of information corresponding to this girl in the memory fragments in his mind, that child with dark brown hair, the last person that the original owner of his body had some attachment to in the world. Nina, Alexander's expression didn't change, his tone was flat, and the storm of thoughts in his mind didn't show at all, he responded naturally to his, niece's, question, did you stay at school yesterday? I've been staying at school these days, the girl downstairs immediately responded, I thought you would be out for at least a week like before, so I cleaned up the house and went to stay with my classmates. Mrs. White who manages the dormitory agreed. I came back today because I suddenly realized that I left a book at home. Are you alright? I feel like you, are strange, I'm fine, I was just a bit groggy just now. Alexander responded naturally, then walked towards the first floor, 
He had already come up with an extremely outrageous speculation in his heart, and now he had to confirm it that he passed Nina on the stairs, the young girl on the stairs sidestepped, curiously looking into Alexander's eyes, and just as he was about to reach the first floor, she suddenly asked, Uncle Alexander, are you going out later? Are you, going to stay at home for a few days? It depends, Alexander didn't look back, because he wasn't sure if his facial expression was natural enough, he just responded in the language he should have according to his memory to his, niece's, question, I'm just going to check the door, if there's nothing wrong, I'll be home for the next few days. Ah, uh, okay, then I'll go buy groceries later, there's not much food at home, the girl was talking quickly as she ran up the stairs, her footsteps quick, her tone light, Alexander, however, had already reached the shop entrance, he took a deep breath and pushed open the door that he turned around, looked up at the sign hanging at the entrance of the shop, a line of letters clearly came into view, Alexander's antique shop. The first few letters were as old as the letters that followed, showing no signs. Of temporary modification, as if it had been like this from the beginning, Alexander frowned, slowly coming to the window next to him, he leaned forward, using the image reflected in the dirty glass to observe his own face, that was indeed a strange face, not belonging to the stern and gloomy phantom captain, but to a middle-aged man with a scruffy beard, deep-set eyes, and a weary look, belonging to the cultist named Ron who had already breathed his last in the sewer, Alexander slowly straightened up, he heard the city slowly coming to life around him, the clear sound of bells ringing as the morning shops opened their doors, the sound of bicycle bells and the chatter of pedestrians gradually filling the streets, a neighbor who seemed to live next door passed by the antique shop, a greeting came into Alexander's ears, good morning, Mr. Alexander, have you read today's newspaper? The deep sea church seems to have smashed a big cultist den, it's really a big deal. The price of a pran news is 12 pesos, equivalent to a frugal breakfast or the cheapest dessert in a 10 block radius, the newspaper can be purchased from the passing paperboy, or one could walk a few more steps to the newsstand at the end of the other street. Alexander had several coins in his pocket and bought a local newspaper at the newsstand. The newsstand owner was a middle-aged man engrossed in reading. He waved his hand to indicate that Alexander could take his newspaper when he heard the coins drop into the box, not even lifting his head throughout the process. Alexander peeked at what the man was reading and found it to be an analysis of a past lottery, outlined with colorful lines that depicted unrealistic fantasies. He looked down at the newspaper he just bought. The front page headline was the news he was most interested in, the venerable church guard, led by Judge Fanna Wayne, successfully destroyed a sun god cult gathering point, capturing many cultists and rescuing several citizens. A photo of the judge was printed on the side of this news. Surprisingly, she was a young woman with a striking scar on her left eye, yet she was still a beautiful lady standing with her subordinates, she was half a head taller than every man around her. The judge was dressed in lightweight armor and a battle skirt, carrying a large two-handed sword that seemed to have come from the era of cold weapons, like a medieval-style female knight, however, behind this lady and a group of church guards, a huge steam mechanism could be seen, with clearly visible turret structures on it. A strange yet harmonious style. Alexander's gaze lingered on this photo for a long time. The news of the cult gathering point being destroyed was good news for him. He could see the villains who carried out human sacrifices being caught without worrying about his identity being exposed. On the other hand, he was more interested in the information revealed in this photo. A female judge who specializes in dealing with cultists, steam-powered armored robots, and church-armed forces equipped with both cold and hot weapons. Information that was hard to come by on the wanderer could be clearly seen in a civilized society for just 12 pesos. As Alexander had thought before, while the wanderer had been drifting blindly for a century, times had changed. Even if not considering the superficial perspective of, who can beat whom, the Pran city state representing the mortal civilization has developed to a, fascinating stage. The intersection was not a good place to read the newspaper. Alexander rolled up the newspaper and tucked it under his arm. He remembered that Nina, that niece, was waiting for him at the antique shop, so he turned to go back. Compared to aimlessly wandering around the city alone, a local person who inherently trusts him is obviously a better source of information. As for the wanderer, Alexander was not worried, even in the state of walking in the spirit world, he could still clearly sense the situation on the wanderer and the condition of his other body. Unicorn Head was steering for him, Isabella seemed to be behaving herself, he should be able to act here for a while longer. After all, the original rules of the wanderer's crew included the statement, the captain will occasionally leave the ship, so it's not a big deal for the captain to take a walk in the spirit world for a couple of days, right? And as his spirit walking continued, Alexander felt that he was getting more proficient in controlling this special, spiritual projection, perhaps soon he could try to control both bodies at the same time, this would not have to worry about the situation on the ship during his spirit walking. At this moment, a sweet smell suddenly drifted from the side. Alexander instinctively stopped and looked to the side. He saw a streetside cake shop, with freshly baked cakes being displayed outside. This is the lower city of Pran City State, and there are naturally no high-end dessert shops. But even the cheapest, coarse cakes made Alexander stop. 
He still had a few coins in his pocket, less than 20 pesos in total, but it was more than enough to buy a piece of cake. After a moment of hesitation, he came to the cake shop and bought a piece of the most common honey cake. The packaging material used by the shop to pack the cake was some kind of rough thick paper, it felt rough to the touch. Alexander walked towards the antique shop with the newspaper and the cake, and his mood was inexplicably cheerful. Walking on the street, talking to people, buying things, returning home. Such simple things gave him a feeling as if he was in another world, he almost savored the feeling of breathing on land, and regarded these ordinary daily routines as some kind of precious life experience. Life on the Wanderer was actually okay, Unicorn Head was noisy but reliable, Isabella was also an interesting person, but it was also nice to experience life on land. Soon, Alexander returned to the front of the antique shop. Before pushing the door to enter, he still looked up at the sign of the shop, the words, Alexander's Antique Shop were still quietly printed on it, with an old-fashioned feeling as if it had not changed for more than a decade. He pushed the door in, the bell rang crisply, and then there was a rush of footsteps from the direction of the stairs. The young girl with brown hair ran down in a hurry, then suddenly braked at the entrance of the stairs and stood still. She leaned on the pillar next to her and stared at Alexander, looking nervous and worried. Uncle Alexander, where have you been? She said quickly, you said you would go to the door to take a look, but you disappeared in the blink of an eye. I thought you had run off to the bar or the casino again. Alexander looked at the girl in front of him with some surprise. He could hear that she was genuinely nervous and worried about something. She was worried about the only relative she had in the world who depended on her, even if this relative was a drunkard, a gambler, a decadent and irritable man, and secretly involved in bloody dealings with cultists. A strange feeling emerged, but his expression did not change much, I just went out for a walk and bought something. As he said this, he walked towards the counter of the antique shop, intending to put the newspaper and cake on it. Nina seemed to suddenly relax, then immediately ran upstairs again, saying quickly as she ran, Uncle wait a moment, I'll bring down the breakfast, you must have skipped it again at this time, I made corn beet soup. Before Alexander had a chance to speak, Nina had disappeared up the stairs. After a while, she came down carefully holding a large tray. On the tray was a simple breakfast for two. Alexander watched her bustling about with a somewhat dazed expression. He saw her clear a spot on the counter efficiently, arrange the food, and then go to the side to bring an extra chair for herself. She was extremely efficient and seemed to be in a good mood for some reason. Alexander watched her work, wanted to help, but found that he couldn't find a place to lend a hand. He had dealt with many young people of her age, but he had hardly seen a child as industrious and efficient as her. Placed on earth, she should be of high school age, even here, she seemed to be a student. Alexander suddenly thought that living with an uncle who had fallen into a cult was not an easy thing, but this girl named Nina seemed to have completely adapted to this life that could not be considered happy in any way, and even managed to find things to support herself in life. Let's eat, Nina had prepared everything by now. She looked at Alexander and said as if she had said it countless times before, Dr. Albert said that if you could eat breakfast regularly and maintain a good mood, it would be more effective than liquor, than painkillers in the long run. Alexander didn't speak for a moment, just silently watching Nina. Just as her expression was about to become anxious and tense, he took the cake he had put aside earlier, opened the packaging, and placed it in front of Nina. Nina was surprised and stared wide-eyed, looking at the object in front of her in confusion, this is. Cake, bought from the corner of the street, Alexander said casually, you're growing, you should eat something nutritious for breakfast. Nina was stunned. She just stared blankly at the cheap cake in front of her. After a long time, she seemed to react, murmuring almost to herself, are you really okay? Of course I'm fine, Alexander looked quite natural, I just suddenly remembered that I hadn't bought you any dessert for a long time. Indeed, it's been more than a year. Nina muttered, but then suddenly burst into laughter, picking up the knife, then let's split it, Dr. Albert said you also need nutritious food. Alexander felt very strange, but after a moment of silence, he nodded. Okay. The feeling was quite peculiar, Alexander could distinctly sense the happenings far away, he could feel the drifter, a living ghost ship, wandering in the boundless sea, exploring the routes on the sea map under the control of a unicorn's head. A cursed puppet with a not-so-sturdy head was pacing back and forth in the cabin, exploring the ship's environment like an adventurer. The dark and deep sea was gently undulating around, hiding countless strange things within, yet, in his other line of sight, he was sitting in an antique shop in the lower city district of Prand, with the sounds of people and cars from the street highlighting the tranquility within the shop. A human girl named Nina was sitting across him, slowly nibbling on the cheapest cake in the lower city district that he was Captain Alexander, master of the drifter, a moving disaster in the boundless sea, he was sitting here like a commoner, having his breakfast, tucked away in the depths of a peaceful city that he wasn't sure if it was an illusion, but he felt a piece of his heart that was always hanging, always uneasy, was gradually settling down. It could be the nerves that had been tense for a long time on the ghost ship, or something else, 
but he felt that it was not a bad thing, seemingly noticing the gaze from the side, Nina, who was eating the cake, suddenly looked up. She glanced at Alexander curiously, Uncle Alexander, aren't you eating? Alexander glanced at the food on the other's plate, is that enough for you? It's enough. Eating too many sweets is not good. Hmm. Alexander nodded, took a bite of the cake, and seriously tasted this rich flavor that he had not tasted for a long time. He sensed the crude sweetness slowly spreading in his mouth, then, he clearly sensed this body starting to process the food that he felt a little more settled in his heart, knowing that the situation was as he expected, this body was more usable than the one he temporarily occupied for the first time, its parts were intact, the time of death was not long, and his soul took over almost seamlessly, restarting the vitality in the body. This was completely different from the previous open-minded corpse that he now had breath, blood circulation, and his heart was beating, although the heartbeat seemed to be a bit slow, but it should still be within the normal range that he shouldn't have to worry about the body decaying, and also saved the calculation of soaking in preservatives, and this way, it was less likely to be exposed in front of ordinary people, however, there was one thing that Alexander was still not quite sure about that he knew. That this body should be sick, in the memory he had swallowed, the negative impression of being entangled with a chronic illness was deeper than all other memories, and the strong alcohol and painkillers found in the cabinet earlier were clear evidence that he didn't know what disease this body had before, because things like the time of onset and the cause of the disease seemed to be memories from a long time ago, and they were already blurred. But one thing was very clear, at this moment, except for the weakness brought by the ordinary physical constitution, he did not feel any problems with this body, did the disease disappear? Has this body healed itself due to the journey of the spirit world? Or is it because the soul projected is ultimately limited in perception, so that he actually cannot feel the problems of the body, and the health status of this body is actually still deteriorating, as Alexander was pondering, he was eating his meal without showing any expression. Then he suddenly looked at Nina, who was eating across from him, don't you have to go to school today? Nina lives in the lower city district, her economic conditions are not good, but the city state of Prand has obviously developed to the extent where basic education is relatively popular. She is now studying in a school run jointly by the church and the city hall, majoring in steam engines, this kind of school can be considered a kind of vocational high school, mainly to supply skilled steam craftsmen to factories and churches, half of Nina's tuition is paid by her uncle, and the other half comes from the city hall's subsidy. For a city state that has developed to the industrial age, it is definitely worth it to train craftsmen in this area even with official subsidies, and it is undeniable that this kind of school with a very clear purpose at least solves the problem of literacy for the common people, Nina is a good student, and in her uncle's memory, this girl has excellent grades in all courses. I don't have classes this morning, Nina nodded, only two history classes in the afternoon. Also, I have to tell Mrs. White this afternoon that I won't be staying in the dormitory for the next few days, Alexander suddenly stopped the movement in his hand, he looked at Nina very seriously and asked, don't you think staying here to take care of someone like me will delay a lot of things? You can live in the school for a long time, which may be more helpful for your studies. Nina was stunned, she looked at her uncle Alexander, somewhat blankly, then suddenly got angry, you shouldn't say that. You're just sick, just take the medicine according to the doctor's advice, my parents entrusted you, it was your parents who entrusted you to me, Alexander corrected very seriously, using the memories in his mind to organize the language, you are only six years old then. But now I'm seventeen, Nina puffed up her face, stabbing the last piece of cake with her fork, your ability to take care of yourself is even worse than mine, if I really move out, you won't be able to keep the room tidy for three days. In fact, you can let me help with the shop, at least cleaning, the windows are so dirty that they can hardly be seen, Alexander listened helplessly to this girl's preaching. He didn't expect that his casual words of testing could bring such a big reaction from her, but slowly, he couldn't help but laughed that he felt a warmth from this girl named Nina, a warm, sunbathing warmth. All right, I was just saying, he shook his head, stirring the last bit of soup in the bowl, it's history class in the afternoon. How are you doing in history class lately? Uncle Alexander, are you really okay? Nina looked surprised, you never, well, at least for the past two years, you never ask about my school. Alexander opened his mouth, just about to say something, but the girl in front of him spoke again, we're studying ancient history recently. Mr. Morris is teaching us about what happened after the great obliteration. To be honest, it's quite interesting, ancient history sounds like a lot of parts are like stories, far more interesting than modern history and contemporary history. Alexander thought for a while, and said seriously, it sounds like you're doing well. Then I'll test you, what is the concept of the great obliteration? Uncle Alexander is very strange today. Although I can't say where he is strange, he is different from usual, but Nina didn't think too much, compared to her uncle's slightly strange speech and behavior, this simple girl was happier that Uncle Alexander finally cheered up, and he seemed to be in a good mood. She was happy that Uncle Alexander asked exactly what she had just learned. So she started to tell Alexander about the knowledge she had just learned with a proud smile. The Great Obliteration happened about 10,000 years ago. 
Although due to unknown reasons, a few ethnic groups with unique cultural heritage, such as elves, gold people, and Jiplo people, recorded inconsistent times in their own calendars, but in general, the archaeological community recognizes that the Great Obliteration occurred at the end of the Order Era about 10,000 years ago, Alexander listened with a calm face, there were all question marks in his heart, elves? Gold people? Jiplo people? What's going on? Are there more than one intelligent group on land besides humans? And elves? Is this the same concept as the elves, in his understanding? Are there still elves city-states living in the steam industrial era in the boundless sea? He couldn't help but imagine some peculiar scenes in his mind, and Nina's voice was still coming from across. The records of the Great Obliteration vary from city-state to city-state, but the more common parts are that the Order era before the Great Obliteration was a time far more prosperous, stable, and safe than today. There was an extremely vast continent, the area of the sea was far from being boundless as it is today, and there were no real boundaries at the end of the sea and the land. After the Great Obliteration, the era was called the Deep Sea Era, which has continued to this day and there is currently no sign of ending. The most significant feature of the Deep Sea Era is that the boundless sea covers almost the entire world, and the land is left less than one tenth of the old era, and they are all divided into islands or foggy foreign lands of various sizes. Today's many city states are built on more stable islands and various ocean-going ships have become a means of communication and contact between islands. In the early days of the Deep Sea Era, the remnants of the Old World suffered heavy losses, the old civilization was almost completely destroyed, and the ancient Cretan kingdom that first rose from the ruins is the earliest ancestor of civilization in the Deep Sea Era that can be studied today. Although the duration of this ancient kingdom was less than a hundred years, it left a lot of legacy that had a profound impact on future generations, including the most primitive and crude classification method for many anomalies and phenomena in the Deep Sea Era, and a large amount of valuable experience in maintaining survival in the Deep Sea Era. The Great Annihilation was the turning point of all history in this world, marking the beginning of what is now known as the Deep Sea Era. According to what Nina had related, Alexander finally had a rough understanding of the earth-shattering changes that had once occurred in this world, and realized that this world was not always as strange and dangerous as it is now, according to historical records, the world before the Great Annihilation was a prosperous and safe paradise. The ocean at that time was not that the boundless sea, as it is now, the limited sea water did not occupy more than 95% of the world's surface as it does today, and humans lived on vast and safe land. Even in the sea, there were no dangerous anomalies such as the spirit world, the abyss, and the subspace. The Order Era recorded in history books gave Alexander the feeling of the world he was familiar with. Although modern people would look back at that ancient era without anomalies, with amazement and disbelief, to Alexander, it was the current state of the world that was completely wrong. There is no detailed explanation of the key event of the Great Annihilation in the history books. Although the archaeological community has been making efforts in this regard, the great differences between city-states and ethnic groups about ancient history always exist. No one knows how the so-called Great Annihilation happened, or what the true nature of that disaster was. A huge chaos and fog enveloped that dramatic change, and behind the fog, was the current deep sea era. The sea water, from unknown origin, flooded more than 90% of the land. The surviving remnants of civilization established city-states and fleets on the remaining islands and small land masses. The boundless sea and the sea mist brought strange things called anomalies and phenomena, which still threaten the existence of civilization. However, Nina didn't know that a ghost captain from another world was absorbing knowledge from her words. She thought this was her uncle testing her homework. Her uncle hadn't been in such a good mood for a long time, and she was just happy. She even felt this moment was particularly precious, because she was worried that at any time Uncle Alexander might revert back to his previous state, and based on past experience, this was almost inevitable. As soon as the strong liquor loses its effect, or the painkillers run out, her uncle would become extremely irritable, angry, and hysterical. So before Uncle Alexander became ill again, she wanted to show him all her progress. Perhaps this could make his good mood last a day or two longer. Mr. Morris is very interested in the history of the Kingdom of Crete. He is an expert in this field. He told us that although the ancient Kingdom of Crete only lasted for a hundred years, it was the first civilization to stand up from the ruins to fight against anomalies and phenomena after the arrival of the Deep Sea Era. The experience they explored in a hundred years still guides most people in the world today. The most important of these is their classification method for anomalies and phenomena. The classification method for anomalies and phenomena. Have you learned this already? Alexander raised his eyebrows, his tone still guiding. From what he had heard before, he had been very interested. Now he was even more convinced that in the eyes of ordinary people in this world, those things that defy common sense should have a strict distinction. Some things are called anomalies, even with a number, but other things, seem to be separately called phenomena, not like his previous impression, all broadly classified into anomalies. He had never heard of this detailed knowledge on the lost wanderer before, 
And now what Nina had learned at school could finally make up for his lack of common knowledge in this area. Nina nodded and said, recalling what she had heard in class, Mr. Morris taught us the simplest way to distinguish between anomalies and phenomena, which is scale. Generally speaking, the scale of anomalies is small, often limited to one object, one animal, or even one person. Most anomalies can be moved by humans, their impact range is also limited, many anomalies even affect only one target at the same time, and under the condition of mastering specific methods, most anomalies can also be safely sealed or isolated. Some of the less harmful anomalies can even be used as tools through specific methods. The scale of phenomena is much larger than that of anomalies. The smallest phenomena are as big as a house, larger ones can cover an entire city-state, or even larger, too large to imagine. A considerable part of the phenomena cannot be moved by humans. They are either fixed in one place, or they operate according to their own will, and their influence is far greater than that of anomalies. Usually, phenomena can affect an unlimited number of targets within their effective range, so much so that they can almost be equated with natural phenomena, hence the name phenomena. Unlike anomalies, almost all phenomena cannot be sealed or controlled. They exist in the world like natural phenomena, operating without external interference, and naturally affecting all targets that meet the conditions within their range. And since most phenomena are dangerous, all people can do is to stay away from these dangerous phenomena, or use specific methods to avoid becoming the target of phenomena. Fortunately, the most dangerous phenomena usually do not move. The pioneers have discovered these dangers for us, so we can safely keep our distance from them. Nina said seriously, then seemed to suddenly remember something and quickly added, oh yes, the old man also specifically told us that these judgment methods and characteristics are only, usually effective. Anomalies and phenomena are things that defy common sense, so no matter how many rules people summarize, there will always be anomalies or phenomena that do not conform to the rules suddenly appearing in the world. Sometimes anomalies and phenomena will even change places, and there are also cases where phenomena are interfered with or eliminated by human force. For example, in 1830 of the new city-state calendar, a phenomenon called mycelium in the city-state of Lenza got out of control. The local church guardians paid a heavy price to banish this out-of-control phenomenon to a nearby island, and that island was recognized as a phenomenon in 1835, later known as Fungus Island. But in 1844, the great Saint Paladin used his life to contain Fungus Island in his own urn, so the phenomenon Fungus Island was delisted in the same year. It became an anomaly again, known as Paladin's Mushroom Bottle, and is now sealed in the underground sacred treasury of the Lenza Cathedral. Alexander listened attentively to everything Nina was saying, his mind whirling at a rapid pace, while masking the ups and downs of his emotions with a calm demeanor. The information he had collected in this short breakfast had already exceeded the total amount he had gathered on the lost wanderer for so many days. Establishing communication with the land and setting up an outpost in a surface city-state was indeed the right approach. Civilization is where most of the world's information is gathered. He subconsciously looked at the girl who was still talking, feeling a sense of enlightenment. A civilization that has normally developed to the industrial stage will inevitably try to compress the basic knowledge of social operation into its education system. A child living within this system may find it hard to realize that the textbooks they come into contact with on a daily basis are a treasure trove, it is the knowledge accumulated by countless people over countless years, and has been sorted and integrated into the most suitable structure for learning and absorption over the years. The books construct the world's most exquisite, nutrient packs, with the aim of making a blank slate of a person into a cog in the operation of society in the shortest time and with the least effort. Even Nina, who loves learning, can't appreciate this. Only Alexander, the foreigner, can realize how precious and easy to absorb this knowledge is. However, Nina didn't notice what Alexander was thinking. She just remembered what her respected history teacher had said in class. So Mr. Morris said at the end of the last class, he said people have summarized countless rules in dealing with anomalies and phenomena, but only one rule is truly always effective, that is, no matter how many rules we summarize, there will always be anomalies or phenomena that do not conform to the rules appearing in the world. This rule is also called the eternal zeroth by scholars, and is by default placed at the very beginning of all related academic books and papers. It was based on this rule that people proposed the famous perpetual inaccuracy law of anomalies and phenomena, which has not been broken to this day. Nina was overjoyed. It had been a long time since she had the chance to have a regular meal with Uncle Alexander, discuss school matters, and see a smile on his uncle's face. This brought back memories of the past, of the time before Uncle Alexander fell ill. After losing her parents at the age of six, this fatherly man became her only family in the world. However, four years ago, a disease that even doctors couldn't diagnose changed Uncle Alexander, making life during this period, quite difficult to bear. Uncle Alexander was still supporting her schooling and maintaining her basic living, but Nina could feel that all the colors of the future had gradually faded from this familiar and intimate small shop, dissipating in the strong liquor, the pills, 
and the sinister and oppressive gatherings of suspicious friends who dealt with uncle. Alexander, she had long since given up hope of returning to the life of a few years ago, but even a slight improvement in the situation was worth celebrating, Alexander was also happy because he had finally gained more information about this world and finally touched the historical context of this world, even if it was just a part of it, it gave him a sense of joy in clearing the fog, the breakfast was over, and Nina got up to clean up the dishes. She was quick and efficient, showing that she often did these chores in her daily life, undoubtedly, the bedroom upstairs was also cleaned by her dot a man who was suffering from a serious illness, living a decadent life, and dedicating most of his energy and passion to the cause of the cult would certainly not do these things, but watching the busy girl in front of him, Alexander finally couldn't help but get up and take the large tray in Nina's hand, let me help you with this, it seems like. You're having a hard time going upstairs. Nina looked at Alexander in surprise, she was about to say something, but he had already taken a step towards the stairs, the girl could only quickly follow him, reminding him as she followed, uncle, be careful, the doctor said your condition is not stable, the doctor. Dr. Albert? Alexander didn't look back, he was climbing the stairs while searching for the corresponding impression in his memory fragments, but there were only a few fleeting fragments, it doesn't matter, he hasn't even figured out the cause of the disease until now, and the most effective medicine he can prescribe is just painkillers. You should still listen to the doctor's advice, Nina followed Alexander to the second floor, heading towards the kitchen while muttering, at least he knows how to maintain a healthy lifestyle, Nina's words were interrupted by a sound of flapping wings, she and Alexander both looked in the direction of the sound and saw a shadow flickering through the crack of the slightly ajar master bedroom door. Uncle Alexander, something flashed in your room. Nina exclaimed in surprise, then went forward and grabbed the doorknob, could it be the cat from next door, hey, you don't, Alexander only managed to stop her halfway before seeing Nina already pushing open the slightly ajar door, revealing the pigeon hiding in the room. A I was standing on top of the cabinet, grabbing a french fry with one claw and stuffing it into his mouth. The sudden opening of the door caused the pigeon to freeze, it stayed in the pose of stuffing fries with one claw, its green bean eyes staring blankly at Nina and the wall on the other side, then it saw Alexander, flapped its wings twice, and made a loud noise, ah, coo? Alexander twitched at the corner of his eye, seeing the window not far away wide open, which was obviously AI's escape route, and facing the window in the distance, you could vaguely see a dock basking in the sun this pigeon went to the dock to get some fries, a pigeon. Nina finally reacted, looking surprised at AI on top of the cabinet, Uncle Alexander. There's a pigeon in your room. I see, Alexander said expressionlessly, I don't know it. AI immediately threw the fries and flew over, landing on Alexander's shoulder and shaking his head. Okay, it flew in this morning, Alexander sighed, it might be a pigeon that someone has tamed, but it's not very smart. I gave it some food and it wouldn't leave. AI listened and made a loud cooing sound that if it weren't for the presence of outsiders and Alexander's previous order, it would definitely be loudly agreeing by now, Nina, however, had no doubt about her uncle's explanation. She just looked at the pigeon with gleaming eyes, and then carefully approached it, observing the pigeon's reaction and asking Alexander, then, then are you going to keep it? Can I keep it? The girl's thoughts were all written on her face, and in her eyes, AI was just a beautiful and cute white pigeon. AI tilted his head to look at Alexander, making a questioning cooing sound in his throat, Alexander suddenly felt that this bird was actually easier to understand when it didn't speak, after a moment, he pretended to hesitate before nodding, you can, but the premise is that the pigeon is willing to stay. It might fly away at any time, and you shouldn't complain then. Nina was overjoyed, great. I knew Uncle Alexander was a reasonable person. In the central prayer room of the Deep Sea Cathedral, the city-state Bishop Valentine, dressed in a black robe with gold trim, stood solemnly in front of the statue of the storm goddess that he was tall and thin, with sparse white hair and eyes as calm as deep water. The large candlestick in the prayer room was burning quietly, the sacred flame illuminating the room. The statue of Gamona stood high on the platform. The goddess had no face, her head was covered with a black veil, and her long dress, depicting many wave patterns, hung from her body to the edge of the platform. Even though it was just a stone statue, the power of divinity was still manifested here, and the whole statue exuded a strong presence. Anyone standing around the statue could feel a vague sense of being watched and protected, this feeling of being watched and protected was real, and it was under this watch and protection that Fana, who came to discuss matters with the bishop, was able to confidently and boldly speak out what she had seen in her dreams. If what you saw in your dreams is correct, then it is indeed the lost one. City-state Bishop Valentine turned around, looking at the young judge who had come to see him early in the morning. Although from the church's point of view, the judge who presides over the use of force and the city-state bishop who presides over the ceremony are on an equal footing, it is quite normal for the judge to seek advice or even guidance from the bishop when it comes to adjudicating supernatural events. So it really is the lost one? Even though she had already had an answer in her heart, Fana still couldn't help but widen her eyes when she heard the bishop's judgment, I thought, you thought that ship was now just a legend, just like the various ghost ship legends that those nervous sailors blow out of proportion in the tavern. 
Valentine knew what Fana wanted to say. The sparse white-haired old man shook his head, his tone deep, the existence of the Lost One is a fact acknowledged by all city-states and the church. It is not a legend, but something that can be found in the church's archives. I know that the Lost One did indeed exist, and the city-state archives of Prand can even find some of the ship's construction drawings and startup files from over a century ago. But all these tangible data are limited to when the Lost One was still a ship sailing in the real world, limited to when Captain Alexander was still a human, Fana spoke, her tone serious. She looked at the statue behind the bishop, her expression becoming more cautious when mentioning certain words. The key is, that ship was clearly recorded as having fallen into subspace. A century ago, thousands of refugees from the 13 islands of Viceran witnessed the ship and their homeland being swallowed by a border collapse and falling directly into the shadow of subspace. In the decades that followed, although there were always eyewitness reports of the Lost One reappearing in the real world, there was a lack of real evidence, and many scholars doubted the return of that ship, the young judge spoke, looking at the old man in front of her. Can something swallowed by subspace really reappear in the real world? So far, nothing other than the Lost One has returned to reality after falling into subspace. Even the Lost One only has post-event eyewitness reports, and scholars in all fields doubt the return of that ship. This is indeed a fact, but this is not the key. The old man spoke, his gaze suddenly falling on Fana, his face bearing a certain unusual seriousness, the key is, Judge, are you afraid of something? In front of the statue of Gormona, the storm goddess, the blessed candle, calmly burned. The divine light from the dome shone around the statue, making the city bishop, clad in a black robe, appear as if he were bathing in divine grace, Bishop Valentine lifted his head in the light, gazing quietly at the still steadfast grey eyes of Fana. His words seemed to carry a certain magic. Faintly, Fana heard the gentle sound of waves surging in her mind, followed by the roar of thunder, with the help of external forces, the power of the goddess finally broke through the veil, exploding in her heart, Fana suddenly gasped for breath, as if she had returned to land from drowning in deep water. Her chest heaved violently, her heart pounding. The feeling of being watched by the gods was overwhelming. In a semi-dazed state, she heard Valentine's voice continue to reach her ears, the existence of the lost soul has historical records, and the prophetic dreams you have encountered are objectively existing facts. With these two points in place, your normal reaction should be to first assume the existence of the threat and then seek solutions, but just now you subconsciously doubted whether the lost soul truly exists. This indicates that you are subconsciously avoiding the information conveyed to you by the prophetic dream. Judge, your subconscious denial of the existence of the lost soul is the proof of its existence, it seems that it is indeed approaching the borders of the civilized world. Fana felt a thin layer of sweat on her forehead, but the sense of a veil that always blocked herself from the goddess seemed to have disappeared, which made her feel a lot easier. The bishop's words made her realize what had happened unknowingly, she had been influenced by the lost soul, this is a characteristic of many horrifying and abnormal phenomena. They cause the affected person's cognition to be confused, leading to subconscious ignorance and denial, resulting in greater and greater influence unknowingly. This subconscious ignorance and denial is a natural reaction of intelligent beings to protect themselves, it is a mentality of avoiding danger, but when dealing with abnormalities, this instinctive reaction will become the source of complacency, and eventually lead to becoming the victim of abnormalities unknowingly, as a judge who often deals with supernatural powers, Fana is well versed in this area, but she never thought that she would fall into this psychological trap her strong will did not have any effect? I don't know when I was influenced, she admitted frankly. In front of the devout bishop, she did not avoid the weakness she had exposed this time, falling into psychological abnormalities due to the influence of abnormalities or anomalies is a completely normal situation, and shame and concealment are of no help. I came straight here after waking up from the prophetic dream. I didn't talk to anyone in between, nor did I touch any books or antiques. I believe I was not invaded by the outside world during this process. But just now you indeed consciously avoided the prophetic dream, so the influence should have occurred earlier, the bishop stared intently at Fana's face, as if observing her eye changes and breathing fluctuations at any time. Have you recently come into contact with anything abnormal? It may be a contamination from the lost soul, leaving a mark in your subconscious. Recently. Fana frowned, then suddenly remembered the sacrifice that fell at the black sun ceremony, remembered the green flames flashing in his eyes, and her severed finger, she widened her eyes and stared at the bishop, the day before yesterday, I led a team to clean up the black sun ceremony in the sewers. Did I report any unknown contamination at the scene afterwards? Did I report the existence of a sacrifice, contaminated? The bishop shook his head, no, you sent those heretics to the church and went straight back. Fana's heart was shocked, did anyone else who participated in the action that day report this? No reports have come, all the files only record things related to the Black Sun heresy. Under the statue of the goddess, the bishop looked at Fana, and Fana also looked at the bishop. It seems we have found the initial landing point of the contamination, the bishop sighed slightly, his expression still calm, 
but his eyes seemed to be brewing a strong force like a storm coming. In the name of Our Lady Gormona, Judge, do you still remember the details of that night clearly? Fana took a deep breath, in the name of Our Lady Gormona, I still remember all the details of that night. The bishop nodded, turned around and lit a specially made incense, then placed the bronze incense burner at the foot of the statue while saying in a steady voice, what happened then? So, Fana recounted everything that happened in the sewer ceremony in her memory, she did not miss any details, with the aid of the sacred incense, her memory and thinking were clearer than ever, and the experience of that night was as clear as if it was happening again, she still remembered the sacrifice suddenly opening his eyes, she still remembered the green flames jumping in the eyes of the sacrifice, she still remembered the flame falling on her finger, but she decisively performed. Purification on the way back to the church, she silently told herself that the pollution had been thoroughly purified, the pollution had been thoroughly purified, the pollution had been thoroughly purified, she murmured this sentence all the way, and all the guardians who walked with her were also murmuring this sentence, no one thought there was anything wrong with this, looking back now, what a terrifying and strange scene it was, under the desolate night, the squad of the church's guards passed through. The silent and deserted streets, each constantly whispering the same sentence to themselves until they returned to the church and in this process, they still thought they were doing things normally guarding the newly captured heretics, cleaning up the polluted ceremony site, escorting the heretics back, the spiritual flame fell on the soul, and the purification of the physical plane brought about by amputation is invalid. What you got is a deceptive comfort, the correct way is to immediately burn incense, sprinkle holy oil on the ground to set up a temporary holy place, and then use the prayer ceremony to call on the power of the goddess to perform spiritual purification. This is my mistake, said Fana in a heavy tone, I should have been more vigilant and alert. It's a mistake, but it's not wrong, the old man shook his head, you have a strong power, but as a judge, you are a bit inexperienced. Fortunately, you are now free from the influence. This shows that the contamination left on that sacrifice was not strong. It only caused psychological interference with you. Through the incense ceremony just now, I can roughly judge its intensity. Saying this, he paused, as if weighing and judging something, the influence on the guardians who acted with you at that time should be smaller. They are just standing around you. The influence should dissipate quickly with prayer in the church. Overall, although the pollution you suffered at that time was dangerous and strange, since the source has been cut off, the subsequent impact is not terrible. According to your performance just now and the feedback from the incense, even if you didn't come today, you would realize something was wrong in a few days. What we need to worry about more is the future. The future. Fana repeated the last word of the bishop, her expression gradually becoming serious, yes, the future, this matter is not over yet, the scene revealed by the prophetic dream is a warning from the goddess, what she has encountered so far is probably just the prelude to a storm. The lost soul has not appeared in the sight of the civilized border for many years. Many people think it has returned to the subspace and become one of the many shadows in the deepest part of the world. But now it seems that Captain Alexander is still obsessed with the real world. Bishop Valentine spoke slowly, turning around to gaze at the statue of the storm goddess. A century ago, the lost soul fell into the depths of the subspace. Although there is no clear evidence, many eyewitness reports mention that there was a big storm lingering in the nearby sea area at that time. The fall of the ship was influenced by the storm to some extent, storm, is the authority of my lord. Fana frowned, do you think Captain Alexander is, seeking revenge against the gods? It's hard to say, even if it's a ghost returning from the subspace, it's unimaginable to seek revenge against the gods. The gods dwell in the divine kingdom, and the divine kingdom is hidden above reality. Everything in the world only knows the truth of falling from the upper world, and never heard of anyone who can go to that divine kingdom, higher than reality, but if Captain Alexander is seeking revenge against the agents of my lord in the human world, there is a high possibility. The Holy Storm Cathedral patrols the world on behalf of the Lord in the boundless sea, most of the time sailing in hidden routes, no one can find its trace, while compared. Pran City is the largest faith anchor of the storm goddess in the world besides the storm cathedral, and it is an anchor of faith that everyone can visit. From this point of view, it is logical for the vengeful ghost to choose to land in Prand. The gods reside in a divine kingdom far removed from the real world. People believe this special dimension to be the cornerstone of the world. Contrary to common belief, this cornerstone is not located at the bottom of the world, but at the apex of all dimensions, the ancient kingdom of Crete described their understanding of the world structure in their surviving scriptures, the cornerstone of the world is at the top, guarded by eternal truth and order. The divine kingdom is within the cornerstone, existing from the beginning, descending from the divine kingdom is the reality where beings live. Mortals in this layer enjoy the remnants of order and can live in a relatively stable and prosperous real world, descending from reality, it gradually deviates from human understanding to the spiritual world. In the spiritual realm, the blessings of the gods become scarce, and twisted, grotesque powers begin to take hold, descending from the spiritual world is the profound deep sea, now unsuitable for the existence of life and dominated by bizarre powers. 
It can no longer be considered part of the physical world, but more like a reflection of nothingness. Beyond the profound deep sea is the very bottom of the world, the subspace depths, home to the shadows of all things. The extremely dangerous ancient gods and various malicious entities lurk within the subspace. I and the records of the ancient kingdom of Crete, the gods established a covenant within the cornerstone. This covenant is the source and standard of all rules in the world. This order flows down, determining the laws of the world's operation and permeating all things in the mortal world. As the depth continues to decrease, the power of order begins to weaken and is gradually overtaken by the subspace, the cornerstone, where the gods reside and the subspace are like the two endpoints of the world, with order flowing unidirectionally between these two points, this is the ancient gift left to the world by the glorious civilization that pioneered the deep sea era 10,000 years ago. Over the long years, countless scholars have studied this layered structure exhaustively, but none have found any flaws in this model. Today, it has become the universally recognized world standard model. In this standard model, mortals of the dust world fall into deeper places, but very few can return from the deep to the shallow. Even if occasionally one or two lucky individuals return from the spiritual world to reality, there has never been a report of any existence defying the heavens and reaching the cornerstone dimension where the gods reside. For this reason, the return of the ghost ship from the subspace has become the most outrageous anomaly in this world. Its return contradicts the world's understanding of the standard model. But on the other hand, the existence of the ghost ship also conforms to the classic statement about anomalies and anomalies, the law of permanent misalignment of anomalies and anomalies, regardless, neither Bishop Valentine nor Fana believe that the ghost ship captain has the ability to take revenge on the storm goddess, even if he has the heart, he cannot do such a thing, because the cornerstone and the real world are discontinuous. It does not have the continuous falling and material interaction relationship between reality and the spiritual world, and between the spiritual world and the profound deep sea. So far, no scholar has found evidence that the cornerstone and the real world can be directly connected. Even the gods can only indirectly exert their influence through projections and metaphors. A ghost ship, how could it possibly counterattack the divine realm, since it is impossible to take revenge on the storm goddess herself, the only choice left is naturally the believers of the goddess in the dust world, the storm cathedral, the headquarters of the deep sea church, is a pilgrimage ark that sails hidden in the boundless sea, coming and going without a trace. The Pope who sits in the Ark has the power to control the storm on behalf of the Lord and is not a good target, then the fixed, obvious, and open plan city-state naturally becomes a better choice. 80% of the people in this city-state are believers of the storm goddess. Fana has already determined that the ghost ship captain is here for revenge. After all, a hundred years ago, the ghost ship fell into the subspace in a storm. Besides, she can't think of any other reason to explain why the ghost ship, which has been missing for so many years, suddenly returned to the real world and pointed its spear at the Pran city state. But what does the ghost ship captain plan to do? Fana frowned, slowly opening her mouth in thought. Bishop Valentine, do you think the ghost ship has anything to do with the recent disturbances of the sun worshippers in the city state? After she finished speaking, she paused and added another sentence. In the dream last night, I saw the burning sun and the ghost ship appearing in Pran together. The simultaneous arrival of two disasters may be a warning from the goddess. But don't forget, in the underground sacrificial field, the sacrificial offering that was polluted killed the priest of the dark sun. That was a, a messenger who had been baptized, the bishop shook his head. At least at that sacrificial site, the ghost ship and the dark sun seemed to be in opposition. Fana didn't speak for a while, just falling into thought due to the bishop's words. The old man across from her continued after a brief silence, regarding those who worshipped the dark sun, I did receive some intelligence from the city-state of Lensa this morning, Fana immediately raised her head, intelligence? The sun heretics are not only reviving in Prand, they have been active in many city-states recently. A large number of sun heretics have been gathering in Prand recently, transiting through Lensa and Moko ports. Some of them have been caught, the old bishop nodded. During the interrogation, those heretics mentioned that sun fragment. Dot. The sun fragment, the remains of the true sun god after disintegration mentioned by those heretics? Fana suddenly reacted, do they believe there is a piece of sun fragment hidden in Prand? It seems so for now. I don't know where those heretics got the information. It could also be the revelation they got in their madness. Anyway, they are now convinced that a part of their master's remains is hidden in this city, Bishop Valentine said with a serious expression. And they see this as the hope of the Dark Sun's resurrection. Those madmen, Fana couldn't help but mutter under her breath, how many lives have they killed in order to resurrect that Dark Sun? The Dark Sun is our name, but in their hearts, the sun god is shining brightly, representing the most authentic order, you can't expect those crazy cultists to have any conscience when they are bloody, Valentine shook his head. They firmly believe that what they say and do is justice. Dealing with them, there are only two languages that work best, one is caliber, the other is weight. Hearing the bishop's remark, which was very much in the style of the deep sea church, Fana couldn't help but twitch at the corner of her mouth, it seems we're going to be busy. 
The boundless sea is never peaceful, and the city-state is also in the boundless sea, Valentine said. Captains have to face the storms in the ocean, we have to face the storms brought by the foolish mortals. Judge, get ready, the Pran city-state may be facing a challenge. Two challenges, Fana corrected seriously, in addition to the followers of the Dark Sun, there is also a mysterious and terrifying ghost ship captain, if the ghost ship and the Dark Sun are really not on the same side, then our trouble has changed from one to two. Bishop Valentine pondered for a moment, perhaps there is another possibility, based on the situation in the underground sacrificial field, the ghost ship might fight with the followers of the Dark Sun. Then the two troubles merge into one earth-shattering trouble, Bishop Valentine, Fana looked at the old man in front of her who was clearly beginning to diverge in thought. A ghost ship returning from the subspace and a group of cultists fighting for the sun fragment in the Pran city-state, possibly accompanied by the descent of the Dark Sun. I can't think of a worse situation than this. Valentine sighed and admitted that Fana was right. Anyway, first work together with the security forces to catch all the sun heretics who have infiltrated the city-state, and eliminate the threat of the Dark Sun before the situation worsens. This is a relatively achievable goal, Fana said. After freeing herself from the mental interference of the ghost ship and entering her own field of expertise, her thinking became noticeably more active, as for that ghost ship, we don't know its next move, we can't start for now, we can only monitor the spiritual world and the sea area around the city-state first. Speaking of this, the young judge couldn't help but shake her head, her expression serious and helpless, damn, who can know what a ghost ship captain will want to do next? I want to add some more tomato sauce. Alexander waved to Nina across the dining table, you can pass it to me and I'll do it myself. Nina immediately passed the tomato sauce, okay, Uncle Alexander. It was now noon, and Alexander and Nina were eating lunch in the small kitchen on the second floor of the antique shop. The meals in the antique shop are simple, a local specialty of Prand, a salty pancake served with tomato sauce or hot sauce, and vegetable soup. It's not some delicious delicacy, but both Alexander and Nina enjoy it a lot, Alexander hasn't had a normal lunch in a long time, and Nina hasn't had lunch like this in a long time either, Alexander feels that he is starting to like this place. After lunch, Alexander watched as Nina cleared the table. He wanted to help with the dishes, but she insisted that he should avoid cold water due to his poor health, as advised by the doctor. So, he could only lean near the staircase, reading the morning newspaper while watching the girl bustling in the kitchen, this seemingly ordinary domestic scene gave him a strange feeling. It that moment, Nina's voice came from the kitchen, Uncle Alexander, any news in the newspaper? Alexander glanced at the newspaper. The first thing he saw was the date, New City State, August 14, 1900. Then, the news of the church's inquisitor leading a team to arrest dozens of heretics. This was probably the most significant front-page news in the entire paper. It says here that the inquisitor has arrested dozens of sun heretics, he said casually, it also mentions that this is the largest heretical gathering the church has successfully cracked down on in the past four years. There are also some reminders for citizens to be vigilant about safety at night and to identify heretical beliefs around them. Oh, I heard about it on my way here. Nina quickly placed the clean dishes into the cupboard, it's terrifying. I remember my teacher saying that those sun-worshipping cultists would even sacrifice living people to the sun god. Who would be so insane as to believe in such a sect? Alexander didn't know what to say as he found the situation too delicate. Should he mention his recent immersive experience on the sacrificial altar, or should he admit that he himself is such an insane heretic, however, one thing was clear. From Nina's reaction, she obviously didn't know that her uncle was a sun heretic. She even had the same normal worldview as ordinary people, thinking that human sacrifice in the sun god's religion was a terrifying thing, the uncle, in her perspective was just a man who had a bad temper and drank a lot due to his illness, and had some, weird friends, the body he occupied might have belonged to a bloody scoundrel, but at least, he had raised Nina to this day and kept her away from the sun god's religion. Maybe one day in the future, a cultist named Ron would truly fall to the last step, dragging his last relative in the world into this endless abyss but at least until today, nothing had happened and it won't happen in the future. Uncle? Why did you suddenly stop talking? Nina was curious about the sudden silence behind her. She looked back with concern in her eyes, are you feeling unwell again? No, I was just lost in thought, Alexander snapped back to reality, shaking his head, you're right, it is indeed an insane thing. The newspaper also mentioned that citizens should be vigilant and report any heretical behavior. You should also try not to wander around outside of school and home during this period. Nina nodded, but then hesitated, but? I've made plans with my classmates to visit the museum in a few days, museum? Alexander asked casually, which museum? It's the one near the school, on the edge of the upper city area, the Oceanic Museum, Nina explained, I heard they've just started displaying mineral specimens from the nearby sea. Can I go? If you want to go, then go, Alexander thought for a moment and nodded, 
There are church guards and city security officers patrolling everywhere now, those cultists probably wouldn't dare to make a move these days. Nina nodded happily, okay. Do you have school in the afternoon? Alexander asked again. Yes, it's history class. I don't want to miss Mr. Morris's class, Nina nodded, he's a very famous expert in the field of history. But it's strange, why would such a famous old man not teach in the university in the upper city area, but come to a public school in the lower city area? Most of my classmates don't like history class, they sleep during his lectures, Alexander shrugged, how would I know? What a joke, let alone the history teacher Mr. Morris, he had just met Nina, it would take him hours to remember where Nina's public school was, and even the original owner of this body probably didn't know much more about his niece's current situation, when Alexander took over his life, he was obviously deeply immersed in the sun heresy for too long, Nina had classes in the afternoon, so she didn't stay in the antique shop for long after lunch. After quickly packing up her things and picking up the textbook she had left at home, she ran off to school, it was nearly an hour's walk from the antique shop to her public school in the lower city area. She had to make every minute count to avoid being late for Mr. Morris's class. Of course, there was public transportation in the city. Even in the relatively backward lower city area, steam powered trams and buses would pass through the streets, but these required a fare of four to six pesos. Nina told Alexander with a smile that running was good for her health. If she had a bicycle, her journey to school would be much easier. Alexander had seen people riding this form of transportation on the streets of the lower city area. In a society that has developed steam machinery, bicycles, an industrial product, are not so expensive. That ordinary people can't afford them, but they are not cheap for residents of the lower city area either. A basic bicycle could cost a three-person family half to a full month's living expenses, a significant burden. Alexander didn't know where this identity he currently occupied would lead him in the future, but watching Nina run off and disappear around the street corner, he felt, if he had the means, he should probably be nicer to this girl, even if it's just for the vegetable soup and salty pancakes, moreover. She's a hard-working student, maybe you should think about ways to make money in this. Civilized city-state with various thoughts in his mind, he put down the newspaper and slowly walked to the end of the second-floor corridor. After opening the narrow window, he stared at the city streets bathed in sunlight, lost in thought that I and this world, anomalies, and divisions have long been intertwined with the progress of civilization. Both the authorities and the church have not hidden the existence of the supernatural from the public. Even a schoolgirl like Nina could learn about anomalies and visions directly from her textbooks, she even knew about the ancient Cretan kingdom's classification standards for anomalies and visions that are still in use today, and she knew the public numbers and names of some anomalies and visions whose laws have been discovered, yes, this knowledge is even open to the public, although not all of it. The authorities and the church of each city-state recognize a list. On this list, the most famous or dangerous anomalies and visions all have their own special numbers. These numbers are not permanent. In special circumstances, some anomalies and visions may be eliminated or transformed due to various reasons, and their numbers may be transferred or vacant, but no matter how they change, one thing is certain, anomalies and visions that have independent numbers and names must have their own special dangers or strengths, the authorities have made public a part of the list of anomalies and visions. On the one hand, they want to ensure that every citizen knows these specific dangers and has common self-protection knowledge. On the other hand, it's because some anomalies and visions are too close to people's lives, these things have even penetrated every corner of ordinary people's lives and every link in the operation of society. People can see them at any time, they cannot be hidden, and there is no need to hide them. Alexander looked up, silently gazing at the sky, vision 001, the sun a giant luminous body moving in the sky, the great vision that ruled the sky during the deep sea era, was born on the morning of the second day after the collapse of the ancient Cretan kingdom, impact range, the whole world, impact units, infinite, self-rotation and movement, cannot be interfered with by human power, meeting the Definition of a vision, historical records, on the day of the collapse of the ancient kingdom, the sea was tumultuous, the city-states shattered, the first generation of the dynasty all died nobly in the darkness, their blood soaked the sea, and then vision 001 rose from the sea, since then, there was peace in the endless sea during the day, the ancient Cretan kingdom, the first city-state civilization established by survivors after the start of the deep sea era, lasted only a hundred years, but left countless legacies that still benefit us today, the word Cretan means, eternal night, in ancient languages that was a night that lasted a century all of this is written in Nina's history textbook.